So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we have participants also joining us online. Um, my name is Maylin Flores Rojas. I work in the Plant Production and Protection Division here in FAO in the area of mechanization. So today's event, it's very exciting, and it's good to see a very big delegation from CIMA. We are going to be talking about sustainable farm power for enhanced productivity. This is a joint event organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and also the um, European Agriculture and Machinery Industry Association, CIMA. So welcome to all of you, welcome to the delegation. And um, I know you're not here today to listen to me, so I would like to jump right away to the agenda. And with that, I would like to give the floor to the Special Coordinator of the Plant Production and Protection Division, Dr. Jordi Jasmine, to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mei Ling. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. It is really a, a great pleasure for us to be here today in this uh, important webinar. So dear Jelte uh, Wirsma, the uh, Secretary General of SEMA, uh, delegate from CIMA, uh, from CIMA who are here today, or probably also some who are online. We are very pleased to have this uh, webinar today. Dear Chike, the um, <clears throat> Deputy Director of uh, Plant Production and Protection, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I warmly welcome you to this webinar on sustainable farm power for enhanced productivity, jointly organized by FAO, and the European Agriculture Machinery Association, SEMA. We are meeting today to examine the crucial aspects of contemporary agriculture, the integration of renewable energy sources. The agriculture sector is at crossroads once again in an era of increasing climate change and sustainability concerns. Energy is crucial theme as emphasized by SDG 7, which aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, including farmers. As reported by FAO AgriFood Systems, AgriFood System consume approximately 30% of the world's energy and a third of greenhouse gas emission originate from energy use. Providing reliable, affordable, and sustainable energy for agriculture, from production to processing, storage, cooking, is essential for boosting yield, increasing incomes, reducing losses, and enhancing climate resilience. Currently, the sector mainly relies on fossil fuels, making transition to renewable energy even more critical. The routine adoption of reno renewable energy solutions hold the promise of not only reducing the sector's carbon footprint, but also enhancing productivity and resilience in the face of environmental challenges. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, energy efficient and affordable solar water pumps have the potential to enhance the life of over 500 million smallholder farmers globally. In India, for example, nearly half of the farmers using solar pumps reported an increase of 50% or more in their annual incomes compared with those relying on rain-fed irrigation. Throughout today's discussion, we will delve into the transformative potential of renewable energy sources, such as alternative fuels to transform farm power supply. We will also explore how this transition can mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, lower energy cost, and shield farmers from uncertainties on of fluctuating energy market. Furthermore, we will examine renewable energy's unique opportunities for farmers in developing countries where sustainable and timely access to farm powers remain very challenging. By leapfrogging traditional fossil fuel-based machinery, as well as those depending on human and drought animal power, these farmers have the chance to embrace innovative solutions that drive both agricultural productivity and environmental sustainability. I would like to sincerely thank SEMA 
for their invaluable contribution to today's webinar, their expertise and commitment to advancing sustainable agriculture practices will be instrumental in shaping our discussion. Last but not least, I want to express my sincere appreciation to all participants here today in the FAO headquarters, Mexico room, and those who are online for your active engagement in our discussion. I'm very confident that today's webinar will provide valuable insights foster fruitful discussions and inspire meaningful, meaningful action toward a more sustainable future for agriculture worldwide. Once again, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I really look forward to our discussion today. Thank you, Mailing. Thank you, Judy, for pointing out the benefits and potential of renewable energy in terms of farm power. Um, we will have today three technical presentations and time also for discussion and questions and answer. I would like to remind the participants online that we, you have a box that is Q&A, and in there you can put your questions as well, and I, I will try to pick up as many as I can. Now, let's move to the technical presentations, and with that, I would like to invite Dr. Ivo Hostens, Technical Director of the European Agricultural and Machinery Industry Association, SEMA, and also Jelte Wilsma, Secretary General of SEMA, to deliver the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Myling. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Yuli. Thank you uh, to all the FAO representatives here in the room to give us as uh, SEMA, as European Agricultural Machinery Association, the opportunity to bring to the table the knowledge that our many companies um, have when it comes to making farming more sustainable and see how we can move beyond fossil fuels that are now the key driver behind food security to alternative fuels. Um, uh, we had worked two years to put together a position paper with all industry experts, companies that are global leaders, um, but also companies that are actually small but have a, no a lot of knowledge to give their input to our position paper. And I'm very proud to give over to uh, our technical director, Dr. Ivo Hostens, who has been uh, gluing all the ideas together in an absolute brilliant way and will present what we can uh, bring to the table uh, for global food security and sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yelta, and also my thanks to uh, FAO that we can bring these messages here that we have been gathering over the past years. Um, it is strongly linked to what is happening in Europe, but I think uh, agriculture as such and the balance of powers and influence that you have in around the world is a bit similar. So I think the messages can also be similar. Let's start from the start. Uh, global warming, everybody knows um, it is an issue. It's not there to go away. Every CO2 that we put in the air, even if we stop tomorrow, might still generate a lot of weather change or weather pattern changes, which can affect also agriculture. So it's crucial also for agriculture that we put a halt to the changing climate. Now, when it comes to the contribution of um, the um, of agriculture, Okay, let's go to the second slide. Seems not to work. Oh, oh, one, one, two, three. Okay, contribution of agriculture. The two things we have to uh, look at is one is the the output from the fields. So we 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 work on the field. We use fertilizers, etc. We plow, etc. We use uh, we have livestock, and uh, that results in a certain amount of contribution to the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, whether it's CO two or methane or lav gas. And that in Europe, it's about 10% of the total. Um, it's considered that in, in, in globally, agriculture contributes even to 20%. But that's also for other reasons. Uh, but also it's because Europe is quite uh, industrialized. So we do the, the maximum with the inputs we have. But then you have also the inputs of fertilizers, pesticides, etc. And you can also make, uh, you can also look specifically at the fuel being used by the machinery doing all the work on the, on the soil. And that is about 1% of this uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions in Europe. And that is in addition to this 
and you can say, okay, 1%, what is that? But we see already that now uh, focus is also on agriculture as a whole to deliver on uh, CO2 uh, reduction. So that's why also we have started to offer solutions for that and trying to understand how everything fits together. Um, why should we put focus on alternative fuels or alternative drives in agriculture machinery? So as I said, contribution to the total greenhouse gas might be rising as well because other sectors will be reducing. Farmers will be encouraged to reduce their overall CO2 footprint, whether it comes from the, the consumer, the retail, etc., uh, or it will be just that uh, in um, uh, countries of the world will say like, well, every sector has to do their bit, including agriculture, and we also want you to reduce your footprint related to the fuels you use. There is also an overall trend. Fossil fuels uh, subsidies will end sooner or later. In a lot of countries, there's uh, tax reductions, etc., for fuels. We also see that there will be a, a diesel fuel kind of ban in transport, particularly in cars. We see this happening, uh, but it might also come in uh, overall transport. So it means diesel fuel is scarcer and uh, there could be rising prices. Will there be still diesel around in this and then 15 years? Also, the options for agriculture are more limited because we are in rural areas. How do you get uh, other uh, solutions to the farmer? There's also the aspect of, will this transformation be economically feasible? Are people willing to pay for it? So we need a tailored approach. We have to look at all the options. The interesting thing is that if we look for solution in agriculture, this could be fit into the circular economy principles where you basically are using biomass to make fuels, for instance. But there could be side effects that could be beneficial for agriculture, that they can reuse things so it's part of the cycle. And I will come back to that. And also my colleague from CNH will come back to that. Looking at agriculture compared to the other sectors, um, in the car industry, in the transport industry, they always look at uh, well to, uh, to wheels. Because it's, you go from A to B, whether it's also to transport stuff or to transport passengers or goods. Um, you have to look from the start of uh, the production of a fuel and then the use of it. We see this as well for us. This this well-to-wheel principle is quite good. We add as well that you can look at it from well to crop produced. Your fuel needs to be seen in what you want to achieve, which is, of course, producing food. So in that aspect, there is much more to be considered than just the, uh, the fact that you want to cover a certain distance. What are now all the alternatives that we can see for agricultural machinery in uh, such an approach of well to crops produced? Well, in fact, there is the fossil resources that we have currently, which is quite easy, and it's one of them, and it's actually for the time being the major one. So diesel fuel is still the fuel that we are using for several reasons. One of it is that it's, it's very high energy dense. So, it's so, 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 so we are actually spoiled in, in being able to use it. There is also renewable energy sources, more and more. We see it. Uh, so uh, last year, uh, Europe did a very good job in, in beefing up the uh, share of uh, renewable energy sources. And this you can use. You can put it in the grid. You can actually use that for direct use in, in a fleet. You could also use it actually to make hydrogen, CO2 capture, and e-fuel production. To be seen, of course, where this would be best happening. And then there is the use of biomass and the use of waste, for which you can make a biomass fuels, gaseous or liquid. And so this is then the mixture that we have. Um, and so then you can see like, okay, we have all these uh, sources of energy, biomass fuels, electricity, e-fuels, you have hydrogen directly and the fossil fuel. You have to understand which vehicles need to be used for that. Maybe there are some fleet scenarios that you have to take into account, how to use these vehicles. And there is also then overall the energy efficiency of the process, which we also take into account. And that would then generate this net carbon neutral agricultural fleet for the production of crops. We considered, and that is something that we have done since the fact that uh, 
over the years we started with diesel diesel was still there so it was all about efficiency of the process same like for cars in the cars in the beginning it was all about making a very efficient car with a good cx uh, good aerodynamics lighter etc uh, and then they said like well there are alternatives let's move to the alternatives but we also saw that so energy efficiency optimization techniques were seen as quite important in the past um, because you actually can do this over the process. If you use the right machines, you can actually reduce up to 20-30% in some cases, uh, depending on the use case, depending on the crop rotation, etc. But the potential is quite modest mm -hmm. in comparison to others. Then there is alternative drives, of course. Um, so battery electric, fuel cell electric. But what is also important for agriculture is basically hybrid systems, so like e-implements, where you can even have a normal tractor from the past, you retrofit it, you have a big battery in the front as ballast, and you use electric implements. So by that, you can already reduce, again, significant certain um, operations uh, or the, the CO2 production of certain uh, limitations. But uh, for the time being, it's limited in application, very high cost. Uh, uh, so you have to really uh, look to where it can be used uh, optimally. And then there is alternative fuels. So sustainable biomass fuels like pharma, HVO, and biomethane. I will come back to that. And there are synthetic fuels, but that's our future. There, the potential is very high, and that's why we say this, this is really something that we can work on. Case-dependent current engines can also be used, and that is an important factor. Also, case-dependent current infrastructure in farms can be used. A lot of people forget that the farmers, most of them have their own infrastructure to refill their uh, vehicles with energy. So looking then at the... Uh, different energy uh, uh, alternative fuels there is uh, from the biomass fuel so there is uh, hvo or renewable diesel this is an interesting one because it's actually also a drop-in replacement fuel you can use it in any engine we have currently for the current fleet biodiesel is a bit more tricky also in storage etc it's not so stable but it's also a good option and it's also a bit cheaper and it's already quite uh, used quite a lot and eh? we have a mixture already in in, in uh, globally but also like in europe seven percent maybe ten percent in the future um and there are gaseous biomass fuel biomethane uh, i'm not gonna go too much in the details there because we have my colleague really going into the details of that one well, hydrogen and there are, we think maybe after 2030 e-fuels might start they need to beef that up. production has to scale up massively to make that really work and then electrification we think uh, well it's coming and it's already uh, out there we are producing electric uh, vehicles but it's always with lower power class so you stay below 100 kilowatt and in specific applications as we said as well the fact that you can add biomass production and biomass uh, fuel production uh, in rural areas or close to farms etc um, plus the fact that you can add it into a circular economy um, we think that biomass fuels in agriculture could be a valuable uh, asset for income and therefore it's not necessarily a transition fuel till 2030 but also beyond because if you say like we move to electrification you basically are saying uh, you have to get rid of the old fleet which is very old, as we know. Looking at the differences between the different uh, fuels, uh, and that's what, uh, what I was saying uh, before, we are spoiled with diesel. With pharma and HVO, we can get to the same level. It's, in terms of energy density, it's almost the same. Comparing it to the newcomers, whether it's gases, gases uh, biofuels like biomethane, or whether it's uh, batteries or uh, liquid uh, fuels, liquid biomass fuels, uh, comparison is a bit more tricky. So you need to find space to put it or you can work less less, uh, less long, etc. You have to take that into account. What are the challenges that we see um, for alternative fuels and drives? There are a number of them. Storage on vehicles, definitely. So if you need to have more storage, also for, for instance, big tanks for, for gas, uh, you need to find space for it. So you need to, you can't, do it and with old vehicles will be difficult to retrofit storage on farm as we said they all have their infrastructure in the farm logistics how to get it there if, if this is something coming from the other sectors cars and transport and it's moved to a, a normal uh, fuel station then you can do it as well to a rural area but if it's specific for the sector or it's in, in minimum scale it's like a niche application then how do you do that and there is also the aspect of 
how much biomass is there actually available, particularly because there is what we what, what we have feared already in the discussions this morning, this food feed versus fuel. Where do we put the biomass in? And you see restrictions in legislation coming and saying, you, we work only with advanced biomass fuel, so this is what you can use and nothing else, which puts a strong, strong limit of what you can use. And there is this re reality check that we did while there were a lot of protests in Brussels and, and um, in, in Germany, actually, there was a big protest because they were cutting the tax reductions on the fuel. So basically, it was a blunt saying, like, uh, we will give you less money. And they, they, of course, the farmer said, well, can we not have something else? Why don't we go 100% biodiesel? Well, we calculated that, and the land use that you need to produce that just for agriculture would be 6 to 8% of, of all the land for making biodiesel. So that would be if you if you look at the biodiesel and HPO that's now produced in in Germany, for instance, two thirds would go have to go to agriculture, which is not really workable. So there are choices to be made, and where of course are we in the picking order of getting <laughs> certain fuels uh, is 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 a, is a question. And there is the competition, of course, of biomass fuels from other sectors as as uh, as the aviation sector definitely because they have strict targets. So they, they, there is a very strong demand there, and producers will be focusing on that. They will produce for the aviation sector with the sustainable aviation fuel. But there is also, for instance, uh, a competition between biomethane that you can put in a vehicle, or biomethane you can put in the grid. So there, there is a competition. So I put some stuff here. It's, we are a hard, we consider ourselves as well a hard to abate sector. But what does it mean? There is also the aspect of will there be e-diesel in the future? For engines and there is a f the fact that we have a very low replacement rate and i forgot to give you the next slide by the way my apologies for that so uh, there is a very low replacement rate um and certainly in the in the lower power classes in the higher power class you see that it's it's much more used and so it was it's replaced much more often so there there is an option but it's mostly in the lower power classes that use also more options for for instance electrification um, so this will take a lot of time there is also, as I said, legislation, legislative restrictions saying like oof, we have to protect our food security, for instance, but also there's the aspect of the balanced financial support that um, farmers would get on infrastructure or for buying new machinery. Now, if you take a bit of the summary of what we see for our sector is that we said below 100 kilowatts, there is a lot possible electrification, but it is a limited option. Uh, for public procurement, for specific cities, etc., it might be an option, but we're looking at solutions that are three to four times more expensive than the uh, diesel uh, fueled version. Beyond that, if you look at high power applications, there are different options. We think that liquid fuels will still be the energy source today, but there is also a gaseous fuel biomethane that is a very promising one. HPO and e fuels are perfect also for the existing fleet because they are perfect drop in replacement fuels. So you can use the existing fleet without damaging your after treatment systems, etc. For a new fleet, then you can use HVO and Pharma. And for a new fleet, you can also use uh, the gaseous biomass fuel, biomethane. Uh, and they're, they're there, they're readily available. The benefit of, for instance, biomethane is as well, you can take biomethane off the uh, the slurry, for instance, which now emits a lot of uh, methane, you could you could actually extract that, and uh, uh, Gilles will talk that, about that uh, much more in detail. We should be seen as a hard to abate sector. We think as well for the production of e fuels in the future, because if if we say like the engine will remain because the other solutions will not be there in the future, or we say like batteries, if we need batteries, they need to be ten times uh, as as energy dense. Uh, and of course, the cost has to go down as well. We see two challenges, availability and affordability. Availability, we, we know there is a low availability and a high demand for biomass fuels. This competition is, is starting and, and we're actually in the back of the row. There is also in, in agriculture a conflict between on one hand sustainability goals for agriculture and, um, and delivering on food feed biomass. So we are asking the question, should there be a kind of prioritization? The, the fact, of course, is with the 1%, are we a priority? So some say like hard to abate means you are a priority. There will be a strict target list for you to do. And then producers of biomass will be producing for you. On the other hand, we also see that 
the biomass production is in agriculture. So should then there be more recognition and promotion of energy crop cultivation? And I speak specifically of energy crop cultivation and not just waste, uh, because that's a bit of the debate in Europe we have, that there is this strict limitation of where you can use certain crops for, for production of biomass. On affordability, we have national subsidies and tax benefits. Um, so how to make the transition to alternatives and should we not go for a kind of harmonization, European-wide or globally? Uh, we see now that a lot of countries do something, but it's it's very targeted and it's different all over the place. Um, there is also the fact that if we really want to make a fast transition, you need adapted engines. How will this be supported uh, and how we will preserve or upgrade the fueling infrastructure? Now, we have done this debate already. That's my last slide. <laughs> Outcome of the... Uh, my apologies. That was my cue. Uh, just one more minute. The debate continues. Um, we had already an early discussion with a number of people from the Commission, but also with fuel producers, etc. And we think there's a few things we have to look at. There is land use impact. And there is a Commission study uh, uh, well, that, that is running right now of looking what really the land use impact is for growing biomass for biomass fuels. Also, we have to consider the biomass fuel production will lead to secondary income, just like also solar panels do. So how can we put that into one big system? Circularity in production of food, feed and biomass is also there. The benefits of digest state, for instance, so that needs to be taken into account as well. Oh, my apologies. So that's what you were saying. My apologies. I was looking too much on my screen. My apologies. Um, I thought you were saying I had to stop now. Come on, stop. <laughs> I was going so fast. and <laughs> just that, that's, that's how you see that the man cannot multitask, but okay. Uh, anyway, so to continue, um, we have a strong message to say that we believe that the engine is still there to stay for our industry because we need this high power. High power in in our uh, operations. So biomass fuels in agriculture, we think, should not just be a transition fuel. We think with the circular aspects, etc., it could be also beyond 2030, which is like this new magical limit. Uh, before it was 2020, now it's 2030. It could be a valuable fuel. We also need more certainty on uh, what taxation and subsidies could be there in agriculture. We need something for the long term. Otherwise, there will be no investments. Farmers will get no money, etc. Also, we need a higher certainty on receiving than the offer of alternative fuels. But again, this is the chicken or the egg, where the demand, uh, the fuel industry says, yeah, well, if you have a, a strong defined demand, if you have a strong regulated demand, even preferably, then of course we can produce for you. So how can we make something that works for agriculture? Maybe a last thing, do we need an agricultural emission trading scheme? Should be definitely not something like for cars and 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 and, and transport, but the, the question is, do we need something that fits the whole of agriculture together? And the minimum that we see is that there need to be a roadmap to figure this out for the future. So we think primary production must have a much stronger voice in the bioeconomy uh, from their own production, because they are delivering to the world's biofuel production. So by this, I think I give the floor to Gilles, who will give the more interesting case on biomethane production and use in machinery. Thank you so much for... Thank you for walking us through these alternative fuels and also highlighting the challenges. I like a lot the timeline that you put there. It was very interesting. And thank you also for pointing out the biomethane, which opens up to leads very well to the second presentation that we will have by Mr. Gilles Mayer that is purely on biomethane's power for farmers. The floor is yours, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So thank you FIO, thank you SEMA for giving a CNH the opportunity to stand up here and to share the direction in which we are going in terms of sustainability. Um, we, if you can put up the slides, that would be great. <coughs> Sorry. So I'm here on behalf of CNH Renewal Energy Branch if you can go back to the first slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Then um, for those who are not completely familiar with CNH, we are an industrial group in ag and uh, construction, and we carry four major brands, Case IH, New Holland, New Holland Construction, Case Construction around the world, and with secondary brands such as Steyr, Raven, and Precision Agriculture. 
for instance, and implement the, plan, uh, implement the brands as well. We operate in more than 150 countries, probably in most of the, the ones that uh, you live in, uh, maybe not, but we're, we're kind of a global player today. Uh, our commitment is to be a leader in the agriculture construction, agriculture and construction in sustainability impact. Mm -hmm. Sustainability doesn't mean only the GHG uh, impact. It's also sustain sustainability from an economical point of view, profitability for farmers, from a food security, from a social impact as well. So what that's what we intend we have in mind with sustainability, and we like to put as a company figures behind what we do, of course. Uh, uh, so it takes a little bit. I don't want to push too much. Uh, <coughs> something going on? No? All right, okay. Now, why I'm going to talk about biomethane. First is that um, in this um, seek for sustainability that we started in 2006 uh, quite actively, we discovered that methane is the second biggest man-made contributor to climate change. Methane, in fact, over 20 years is 86 times more harmful than CO2. Over 100 years, it's only 20 times. So when you look at 100 years, it's not so dramatic. But when you look at 20 years and when we all think about 2050 uh, targets, this is a dramatic impact, 86 times. So this is why everything to do with methane, everything that can destroy methane uh, is is um, beneficial for everybody. The, sec the last part on convincing us to go into the methane direction is that methane is the only greenhouse gas that can power itself, its own capture and its own removal by providing energy. So the methane, the biomethane can make sure, can in, um, produce more methane in the process. And with the combustion engines, as Ivo just mentioned, we can destroy it. So this is rather the good news. What, whatever the level of emissions are, because unfortunately, the experience now, after the IPCC figures from uh, the Paris Agreement, we discovered that the real methane emissions are far greater than that were take those that were taken into account. We have solutions to offset and destroy it. That's that's the good news of the presentation. CNH, we started in 2006. Uh, we're, so we're not here by chance. Uh, it's because we went through uh, methane research. We went through hydrogen. We went through methanol, we came back to methane, we went on hybrid electrification, and we carry today a um, alternative fuel strategy now, that, which is embedded with both electrification and biomethane. As I will mention, there are so many constraints with other fuels in terms of autonomy and space, volume, uh, weight, that these are the two preferred um, alternative fuels on which we're working because they can provide, depending on the horsepower of the machines, they can provide the solution for a full day's work for a farmer. Now, as you said, Ivo, the well to wheel is a subject. Now, when we think about the tractor itself, we stop at the, at the wheel. But when you think about the emissions that we communicate so much for the on-road, it's only what you see on the bottom right, which is the tank to wheel. But if you look at the well to the tank, there's so many, so many uh, aspects that are not taken into account with the own, looking at only at the tailpipe or at the emission. And that's why we look at the well-to-wheel complete circus in terms of um, offsetting the production of that GHG through this process. So this is our driver, and this is why we favor everything that can be local supply, reduce transport, and reduce the unstable cost for the farmer at the end of the day. Uh, so I have a problem with my slide. It's, sorry about that. Slide, yep, seven. So I will need one extra minute. <laughs> 
All right. So go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. So this is where our farmer's lowest investment scheme is coming up with a new, what we call Benjamin solution. Um, CNH Renewable Energy invested into a company, a startup in the UK called Benjamin. And this is favoring the local production, local storage, and the local consumption of clean biogas and therefore biomethane. With the, we also reduced the scale of the production by having an upgrader which is mobile, which means that we can bring the, upgrade, the upgrader to different farms and mutualize the investment there without having a big uh, plant and a huge investment or capex exposure from one single farm. And by doing that, we localize the aggregation, the distribution, we secure the cost of the farmer from everything that is, um, let's say, unstable due to any kind of political situation uh, impacting the fossil fuel uh, cost, uh, like uh, every, every, any kind of international event you can mention. There are many to uh, take as an example. We address this to small, medium, and large farm solutions, dairy. Uh, so when we say small, we're talking about starting around 80 cows, uh, which is above uh, average on many, many, uh, in many situations. But it's already so much smaller than what we uh, what we used to have with biogas plants. And what is very important is the digested returns to the uh, soil with a very enhanced um, concentration. So when you look at the circle side of it, we start, of course, with livestock grazing. We capture the methane from the manure into a very um, sealed but custom-made cover. And this cover is going to enable us to capture all the biogas that we filter and we upgrade to into this processing, mobile or not, depending on the decision of the farmer. And we, comp uh, we store the compressed methane, and then we can run machines, tractors. We already have T6 tractor, for instance. The T7 is coming uh, end of 2024 to the market. So we're talking about 160 and 270 horsepower. Uh, today, we already are launching an electrical tractor. We have electrical construction material. We have the group uh, has... Um, on-road vehicles as well. So imagine that the farmer can not only um, produce its own electricity on the farm, charge whatever vehicles he wants. So he will uh, move, he will uh, use the um, the electricity to run his milking parlor when he's mechanized. Uh, he will use the electricity to charge whatever machine he wants, or use the methane to run whatever 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 fuel machine he wants, like a, like a tractor. So everything's on site, which means that we're really running towards a full energy autonomy of a farmer, as low as the size I just mentioned, starting quite low. And it's a very modular system, and you can scale it in time, which means that you can start low, grow your farm, and adapt the situation. But we can also address quite large farms as well. So just as an example, with the first... Um, uh, farms that we run in the UK uh, with 90 milking, 90 milking farm, one example, for instance, we brought within two years the net zero footprint of this farm from above, so 734 tons CO2 equivalent, and we're offsetting 800 tons. So that's a negative farm footprint now in terms of GHG emission. That takes into account of course, uh, no, sorry, uh, that takes into account capturing, but also using the gas on site. By doing that, which is very interesting, is that we, the farmer is saving so much cost that they made a saving of 47,000 pounds in a year, knowing that these farms operate with a profit of zero in average or minus something to plus 10,000 pounds a year, this size of farm. And now they spare 47K. So this is future, this is sustainability, and this is transmission to their kids. And this is therefore employment for the future, for future food security and so on. So this is a real game changer in terms of sustainability. By doing that, with the, with the um, concentrated, um, uh, with the concentrated uh, digested, avoiding 
uh, reducing up to 50% of the chemical fertilizer, this is part of the savings, uh, um, reducing by 50% of the chemical fertilizer, we obtain also a fantastic soil regeneration within two, three years, you see the difference in terms of warm density, in terms of grass density, it's, uh, it's quite impressive. And last but not least, the, therefore the milk that is produced is becoming carbon free, which is potentially in many countries an additional revenue for the farmer on top of the savings I just discussed. Now what is not mentioned because in the UK, as we all know, it rains quite a lot. <laughs> That's up to, they're up to the reputation. But in many countries, the cover that we put on the slurry lagoons recuperate 100% of the rainwater. So this is not wasted, and this is taken into account uh, for whatever use of the water, uh, wherever it's needed. It all starts with the cover, as I just mentioned. So on the top left, you see a retrofit cover, so an existing slurry lagoon, and the fact that you seal it in fact, you take away 50, I mean, you take away 90% of the uh, water. That means that you, by um, effect, you increase 50% of your storage capacity. By doing that, suddenly a farmer doesn't have to invest further into more storage because he's not able for the soil, the, the pollution, he's not um, legally uh, able to spread the manure. But here, since he increases his capacity by 50%, he chooses when he wants to do it. So he really manages also the crop in terms of using the manure the way he wants. On the, top, on the, on the, the right, you see uh, one of our first farms, which is a um, completely new cover. So this is a far greater investment. So on the left, you have something that we can install within three months. On the right, something that takes a little bit more time over a year because of all the, all the, uh, the uh, groundwork. And it goes as far as fueling a tractor. So you see here the mobile upgrader that you can easily put on a van. And this van will, uh, this uh, upgrader will uh, uh, will power a genset for electricity purpose locally, or you just fill in your tractor or bottle banks that you see in red on the back. So this is a fully autonomous uh, farm direction in which we're bringing this. So it, when you think about today, um, I think the uh, worldwide, the the assumption on the global emission is that every citizen, every human being is creating 4.7 tons of CO2 per year. With the 800 tons that we just spare on one farm, in fact, we see that one cow is compensating 1.9 citizen CO2 footprint per year. One cow, 1.9 footprint. It's quite impressive. We are impressed by the results. So in fact, for us, livestock emissions are not any more a problem. Even if we see that the emissions are higher than what we thought, there are solutions, and this is what's coming right now. But it's also a subject of how to address, how to start the dynamic locally. And uh, so there's a lot of work to do to bring this knowledge, this awareness, and this um, so let's say this investment to the first farmers to create the dynamic. Thank you very much. I like a lot that last uh, statement, very optimistic. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to remind the participants that uh, we are recording the event, so we will share the link afterwards. Now, we have a little bit of time for burning questions. If there is any in the any questions in the participants in the room? Don't be shy. Yes. Please introduce yourself briefly. Charles, Charles yeah. de Baardemaker from the University of Leuven, Belgium. I think it's very, very interesting the evolution that we see there. Of course, how do you think your colleagues in the industry will go along? Or can it be that Every company has different solutions so that there is the compatibility um, may be a problem. Um, I think that first, um, there's no one alternative to, uh, to diesel, to fossil energy, whatever happens. So we need a combination of different uh, fuels, for sure, or different solutions. Biomethane here in this case is one. 
but the livestock will not be the solution to cover all the needs of agriculture. It will not be the solution also to run uh, very high HP machines. I mean, a combine or a very, uh, very strong uh, tractor, it's more uh, HVO, which would be the solution. So there's not one solution. So everybody has to step into bringing an alternative to the market, to the farmers, and each farmer would have anyway its own specificities depending on its farm of course mm -hmm. but all the economic aspects you mentioned the um the rules the, the let's say the uh the taxes that differs from one country to the other so we're really at the beginning so this is where uh private companies like us invest like uh class who's in the room for instance but um we also need the government to support dynamic to give directions and it's true that today um, there are a lot of hesitation between different fuels, but it's it's wrong to say that there's one solution. There are two questions in the, in the chat box. Um, I think they are directed to Mr. Mayor. Um, one is when considering a small and medium farmers, how much technical knowledge is required to implement this solution? Could this be a significant barrier in implementation? And the second one, is there any part in Africa where this technology is being used? This person, uh, William, there is uh, interested in promoting this technology in Niger Nigeria and is looking forward to your response. Over. Very good. Um... First, uh, to what's the technical knowledge? Um, what we do at uh, Benham and Inside CNH Group is we try to find a solution. In fact, we carry the solution. Uh, we bring the solution to the farmer, and he normally has nothing to do. That means that we work on IoT tools, internet. Uh, so there has to be some kind of connection through uh, internet. That's true. But we, we cover that. And then we have a local player. CNH network is quite strong across the world. And we have a local player that should be in case of for maintenance or from, uh, let's say, uh, repair or something, be operating. But um, biomethane is still something on which you need to beware in terms of security. Dangerous gas, uh, you don't... So there's quite some security matters and you don't give... You don't want to give access to anybody to the uh, around the covers. So we try to make it as easy for the farmer. But when you know farmers, they want to be impl implicated. They want to know more what's going on their farm. So they will just naturally upgrade their knowledge. But they don't need to be knowledgeable from the beginning at all because we're there to support. The second question for Africa. Right now, the solution is uh, starting in the UK. We're expanding in Europe in this year and uh, and uh, next year. So there's nothing in Africa so far, but we are, um, let's say, kind of, uh, we have to prioritize the, the region in which we need to develop. And this is what we're doing right now. Thank you so much. There's a question for Ivo Holstens. So you mentioned um, a milestone by 2020. Could you please remind us what is what was that milestone and why it was pushed by 2030? And if is it likely to be pushed again? Thank you. Well, I think uh, 2020 was a very interesting milestone for a lot of things, I think, in the Commission. Uh, 2020 was like, this is when Europe will break out of its... Uh, and will will be the, the the leading factor in technology and whatever uh, also sustainability etc. We know that it was not completely materialized, so they put the next milestone, which is 2030 for a lot of or in some cases 2035. Like for instance for cars, you know, we go full electric 2035. So it's always uh, easy to put something 10 20 years in the future, but we don't know what it what will happen basically. So. If you know, so I cannot go specific on what, what was all in the package for 2020, but it was massive. Uh, so, but I think there is a bit of more realism. They also go much more into the details for the future. They also, you see that they go more sectorial. So it's much less this horizontal thing. Uh, and I think this is this is actually something that that in Europe, the European Commission has learned to be not just having this horizontal big strategies, but have also the tools to go more holistic as well inside the uh, implementation measures. And that I think yes. is, is uh, quite
quite beneficial for also for us as industry that we can have a discussion not just on the very narrow vertical isolation that they will put on us but that they look much broader and we should that's why also we do this exercise to tell them like yes this is also what we need in our industry you have to look at the whole of agriculture and solutions we need and that's what we said like uh, there's not one solution for all Thank you so much. Now let's move to our last but not least presentation. Now is now it's time for FAO's opportunity to present. Uh, so I would like to invite Joseph uh, Kinsler to who is the lead of the Sustainable Agricultural Mechanization Subteam in the Plant Production and Protection Division to present um, his um, its slides on farm power on mechanization for smallholder farmers. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Meili, <clears throat> and good morning, everybody. Um, now that we had these two presentations uh, from Europe, and they, we are here in the FEO, who is the custodian of the smallholders specifically in Africa, I think we, with my presentation, I tried to bring us back into, let's say, situation as it as it exists today in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think. Uh, just to complete uh, this discussion uh, this, uh, on energy. In Africa, power is, of course, as everywhere, as everywhere else, indispensable for agricultural activities across Africa, driving critical tasks from land preparation to post-harvest and processing. In, it enables mechanization, irrigation, transportation, and preservation of pivotal and en enhancing agricultural productivity and food security, which is which is key, as we know. However, we have to acknowledge that um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we still have um, the blue tall bar on the left is the level of hand power, hand labor, muscle power that is in use, which is about 65% in Africa, while we have about 25% animal traction, uh, animal power, and about 10% mechanical or machinery power like what we are used in Europe. And this is compared to the other three developing regions, Asia, Near East, North Africa, and Latin America, and the Caribbean, uh, significantly different, where, where in these other regions we have about 25% hand power use or muscle energy, uh, human energy, uh, also 25% animal traction still, and about 50% um, mechanical or machine power. <clears throat> this is the situation today. Um, mechanical energy is used in farming. We just, I mean, fossil fuels are. are are the one that is driving the the mechanical machinery and the, the, the machines that are available in in Africa, tractors and irrigation pumps mainly. But we also have electricity for running equipment, lighting, refrigeration, processing, cool chains, facilities, and and the phones, of course, the mobile phones that are now everywhere in Africa too. We also have renewable energy sources like solar and off off grid power generation and water. Not there was something missing. So for, if you look again at this power for farming, and this is a very interesting slide, uh, on the, the left very low bars are, is Sub-Saharan Africa in, and the use of tractors in 60s, 80s, 20s, and today. While the second one is, East Asia, the third, the middle one is Asia, South Asia. The, the, the second to the right is Middle East and North Africa, and the right is Latin America. So at the time of independence in the 60s, Sub-Saharan Africa was at the same level of mechanization and actually a little bit higher than most of Asian countries. But five decades later today, uh, tractor use is the highest in Latin America and the Caribbean, followed by Middle East and North Africa. And Sub-Saharan Africa has basically not moved. It's it's stagnating since the 60s. And it's kind of a phenomena that we need to, we try to tackle, we try to overcome, we try to do what's possible to to change it. But it's, um, it seems to be a challenge that, that um, is, is 
keeping us busy for at least another decade or so to change the situation. But we are working on it and we need the industry for that, That's, uh, including uh, the, our colleagues from SEMA. So the fossil fuel supply challenges. Um, farmers for mechanical power, those who have mechanical power, often rely heavily on fossil fuels for essential farm operations due to limited access to alternative energy sources. So what we just heard is basically not available yet in um, sub-Saharan African countries. There is a supply instability except exacerbated by price fluctuations and import dependencies impacts this impacts on the agricultural productivity partly in remote areas with limited availability import tariffs contribute to the high operational cost for farmers impacting profitability and agricultural productivity and then we have the limited financial resources and uh, and access to credit that exab exacerbate the affordability challenges, especially for the smallholder farmers. Looking at the electrification situation in in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is a, it has the lowest electrification rate globally, with approximately fifty percent, fifty point six percent of the population accessing electricity at the moment. Um, Rural areas are disproportionately underserved. Here we we have only 34% of the rural population that has um, opportunities for mechanization and modernization. The electrical production for renewable energy sources, excluding hydroelectric, is about 11.2% according to the World Bank. <clears throat> However, we have the opportunities for improvement. Africa possesses abundant renewable energy resources, including solar and wind and hydroelectric potential. We need to increasing investments in renewable energy and infrastructure and off-grid solutions can expand energy access and support sustainable agricultural development. The involvement of governments and international organizations is crucial here but also the collaboration with the private sector and partners in the development agencies are very crucial. In conclusion, addressing Africa's energy deficit is essential for unlocking the pot agricultural potential and enhancing food security and improving the livelihoods in, in this continent, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the integrated approaches that combine renewable energy solutions with agricultural mechanization, and these can drive inclusive growth and sustainable development across the continent. And we hope that will happen and that we can work on this together. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for taking us back to the regions where FAO works the most, Asia, Latin America, and especially Africa. Now we have more time for discussion. Um, who wants to go with any comments, questions, clarification? The floor is open. Happy to, happy to take the floor. Uh, thank you, Myling. Thank you all for the presentations. I think we need to take into account that farming everywhere at the, at the end of the day is um, facing the same challenges. So if you're small or big, you need energy. That doesn't matter. Um, I think that's because otherwise we get a discussion be between big against small, or, but farming um, is, uh, f farming needs energy. That's one. Second, um, farming is very, very diverse. And I would like to underline what Ivo also said, uh, one size doesn't fit all, one solution doesn't fit all. Uh, that's very true for farming. Um, every farming region has its own traditions, its own culture, its own experiences, its own, its own knowledge, um, producing different types of food. Um, so we are um, very eager as an industry to be always open to more than one solution for sure. We need to look at the whole picture. Uh, the energy demand is, um, is uh, um, one that will remain there 
for decades and maybe uh, much longer to come when it comes to fuels. And um, uh, we get electrification, of course, we get other sources that um, might help out, but we need to keep an open mind. And we do that as an industry very much because the range of technologies available and the range of technologies um, developed is absolutely incredible for small to big, to, to medium to big, for, for dairy, for arable, for, for, for specialty crops, for rice, you know, uh, potatoes, whatever you can think of. And I think that is something we should embrace globally to keep it uh, open as much as we can and not block technologies because there has been the tendencies uh, here and there to to effectively block uh, technologies from coming into the market and um, enabling farmers to improve the sustainability of their operation. And um, I think we can agree around this table, or I'm uh, misreading the faces I'm looking at, uh, smiling at me while saying this, that, that we should keep that openness to technology very much alive. Thank you very much. Yelte, good point. Like different solutions for different contexts, different socioeconomic con conditions. I would like to give the floor now to Fen and then to Heiko. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'd like to congratulate all the speakers. And I do feel that from my own experience, technological innovation comes from the private sector. So it's great to see this partnership. And I'm sort of following on a little bit from the question that was posed by a colleague from Nigeria and how we can move towards adaptability in in Africa. And the work of Yosef and the team has shown that, you know, the likes of how to access, maintain, repair equipment has to be done as a third party. It's not done on farm. It's done through higher services. And my question would be both on biomass, because there's a competition in sub-Saharan Africa for whatever biomass is available to also be used to improve the structure of soil. So this needs to be balanced. Um, and then the second question is about the methane, which I really like. Any idea of trying to remove methane uh, from the atmosphere is obviously of benefit to the whole planet. But the closed system with the livestock, I'm just struggling to see how that could be scaled down to a farm level. And one of the things that Again, with the higher services, there's this aggregation. So many farmers are actually receiving inputs as a consequence of having the same need, but it's a third party supplier. But there could be some risks in terms of transportation of whatever manure is available to a single processing plant to then be made available for the energy. And excluding the enclosed system, I wonder if there's any way of sequestering methane from the air and then using that instead, rather than having the enclosed system, which is dependent on livestock. And back of my mind, as well as that livestock production in 20, 30 years, maybe less than now. So I'm not sure how sustainable that is. So these are my comments, thanks. So I will try to start answering the question because there are a lot of aspects in that. Just to finish on, on, on the point, uh, capturing from the air is quite interesting, but it's already quite diluted when it's in the air. The second thing is that we don't only capture the methane, but we also capture the ammonia. And the ammonia is something that also you want to get out of the uh, out of the way. So it's uh, it's I mean, um, we we usually in the industry we go to the root source, the root mm -hmm. cause. So that's where the uh, that's where the manure is. In fact, there's a, there is also some research doing on the enteric uh, aspect of methane because the the cows um, also uh, sorry my English has a limitation here, but it's uh, from the front. Let's say um, so that's that's in fact when we see in st statistically, it's uh, something like twenty five percent of the overall emissions from a cow. So it's only 25%, but it's good to, and then have, we, there are some research done from the private sector in terms of with the, uh, the, feed, the, the quality of the feeding uh, or the additives in the feeding, unfortunately, but organic, hopefully, uh, are going to reduce this. So we, we tackle, let's say, from the front and the rear. So here I'm more on the less glory, uh, glamorous rear uh, of the subject. Mm -hmm. 
if that starts to answer the question. But I'm not saying it's not impossible, but you're from the air, you're tackling something which is even more uh, challenging. And I, I just like to add one point is that uh, I think Yelte, you're right. There's a commonality in everything around energy. But I think that the topic, and especially when I listen to Joseph in terms of the uh, bringing us back to reality in areas such as Africa, for instance, everything that is local, that can be autonomous, is something that we really need to focus on. Because there's no grid, there's uh, transportation is a waste. Uh, as you said, and that, there was a point on the, on the subject about transport, transporting the methane, uh, the manure, that exists. Uh, it happens already in Europe, biogas plants, biomethane, well, bi bio, <coughs> sorry, biogas plants somehow look at that. Um, the organizations for biogas plants development, and we see governments are thinking about that, but uh, it's without knowing solutions that are coming. Uh, so there will be any way a balance of the, every kind of solution, but yes, manure can be transported, that's for sure. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to um, take a few questions before moving to the um to the responses. Heiko, Chike, Leone, and then Emilio. Thank you. Yes, I would like to ask a question then on providing the type of solution for Africa in terms of uh, energy source. Do you foresee? I, I, it's a general question. Uh, like there is a limitation. You said uh, that we below. 100 kilowatt, it does not really make sense to, I mean, there is not, uh, it's not cost efficient, if I understand. Uh, would that, like in cases of Africa, we are in diesel power trying to have like small scale machinery and so on. So having smaller scale machine rather than the ones in the industrial country. So does that mean that in Africa, it doesn't really make sense to go to this electric power solution and find other alternative? If so, what? So in terms of understanding the possible technical jump when we are flattening and not improving much in, in the mechanization in Africa, does a technical technological jump would help or it's still we have to try the small scale diesel powered machines to scale up rather than trying to find these innovative solutions, but that are costly. So I would like to have the industry point of view on that. Oh, can we take another question before? Oh, yes, yes. yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Berlin. And uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, for your very uh, insightful uh, presentations, you know, on the state of the art, on, you know, the development of uh, alternatives to fossil fuel uh, for powering uh, farm mechanization. Um, here at the Food and Agriculture Organization, and I'm speaking mostly to our colleagues from CIMA, and the other European entities uh, who are participating. Here at the Food and Agriculture Organization, we deal with real life situations. Um, and uh, what I have open here is the Global Report on Food Crisis uh, 2024. So um, over 281 million people uh, were acutely hungry last year. And, um, you know, if you map these vulnerable populations across the world, it can, you can have a, a very neat overlap with um, the present with uh, the the graphics that uh, uh, Joseph uh, uh, presented in his uh, presentation uh, on the per capita use of mechanization, and we are talking about mechanization in general without any finesse, without any considerations for for you know sustainability or greenhouse gas emission efficiency those remain intellectual uh, those are intellectual uh, 
concerns uh, for many parts of the world where food insecurity and malnutrition are pervasive. So what our leadership uh, wants of us at FAO is to reverse the trend, to work with countries to remove uh, food insecurity and malnutrition. And we are well aware that the Industrial Revolution has happened. There is no going back. So um, for Africa to attain the kind of autonomy uh, for uh, uh, South Asia, for Central America to attain the kind of food security and nutrition autonomy that has been alluded to, there is no gain saying the fact that they have to have mechanized the uh, uh, agricultural uh, uh, systems or agri-food systems. So, and uh, we are also mindful that uh, mechanization is not a standalone. If we start looking at other aspects of uh, good agricultural practices, like irrigation, fertilization, pest management, the use of quality seeds and planting materials, we get the same kind of scenario also. So my, I would want to hear the perspectives of uh, our colleagues who are visiting. Um, what are your thoughts on bridging this north-south divide? Um, in uh, in terms of access to good agricultural practices, including um, mechanization as a pathway out of uh, lingering food security and malnutrition. I thank you very much. Can I ask Leone and then Emilio to quickly uh, pause the question so we can move to the responses, please, thank you. If we consider this technology as generation zero, maybe it's not zero, but let's say if this is the baseline, how would you, how much time you think, I mean, do you think there's room for improvement in, some, in terms of efficiency, space, capacity of production in the next, say, 10 or 20 years? Or you think it's already reached, it has already reached a plateau? And also another question is, how much do you think this technology is scalable down, for example, to reduce size and application in, in the future? Like, what's, what's your feeling? Thank you. Uh, Emilio Gonzalez from the University of Cordoba and the European Conservation Agriculture Federation. Uh, thank you for the for the meeting. And I think it's a, we are talking about very important things here. My question would be, uh, when I hear about uh, local, adapted to local conditions, sometimes it seems that anything can be included, can be uh, accepted when it comes to soil conservation, uh, input reduction, and so on and so forth. Uh, do you think that we could agree on principles uh, that should be embraced in an agricultural system rather than practices? And the practices included in the systems should be followed everywhere. Because when we talk about soil conservation in Europe, we should be at least being agreeable with the, what can be used in, in Africa, in America, and taking the opportunity of, of the next World Congress on Conservation Agriculture, supported by FAO next July. I think it, it's important to align ourselves with the principles rather than practices. And of course, in this sense, with the, when it comes to fuel consumption, we know that conservation agriculture is saving 50% of fuel costs uh, from the very first season. Thank you very much. A lot of comments, a lot of questions. Please, the speakers, feel free to jump in and respond as, as you can, as you wish. First, so shall I take the first question? Because I, I uh, was... Um, um, that was the first question. Um, Sorry? That was the first question. Oh, that was the first question. Sorry. No, I'm very struck by what you say, but I'm, I would like to play the ball back and say, what can you advise us as industry? Because we have 
we saw the statistics Joseph showed. Um, what can you advise us so we can take that back home to our headquarters and uh, and think about it? Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Secretary General. Uh, th that that is legitimate and um, is um, is um, a tangible thing that can come out of this interaction. In one word, I would say partnership. Um, as you think, as you think about, um, you know, uh, your corporate social responsibility. Uh, the things you want to do as, um, you know, uh, responsible uh, uh, global citizens, as members of the international um, human uh, family, uh, do think about uh, partnerships. And the Food and Agriculture Organization, you know, has uh, a mechanism, has a mechanism for engaging with engaging with partners uh, in order to address these uh, real life uh, situations. Uh, the organization has come up, has developed uh, a new, well, not so new anymore, a private sector engagement strategy. I may, I may not be uh, quoting the name verbatim. And um, but we will be interested in engaging with you. Um, Yurdi, in his opening remarks, alluded to leapfrogging technology. Perhaps we don't have to go back to, um, you know, the heavy polluters um, in, in uh, South Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Basically, a, a meeting of minds, a meeting of minds and we can figure out a way where, you know, um, we don't have to be criticized for with conflict of interest and things. I can easily think about um, technologies that are pre-commercial. You know, how can we work together to strengthen institutional and human capacities in order to make available you know, uh, to the rest of the world, what you already consider, what you take for granted in Europe. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to add on that a, a bit from my own experience. Uh, you know, we have also a bit of a crisis in Europe. Uh, the tractors are going regularly to, to to Brussels to make their point um, because they don't get enough for the investments they're actually doing. So a lot of farmers are going bankrupt as well. Um, and that's also partly because we ask more and more of them in terms of sustainability, et cetera. Um, and there are two things. One is everything is changing so rapidly and it is unclear what is the long-term perspective. It is this long-term perspective that makes, and that is typically for your culture, the long-term investments horizons are also much bigger than for any other sectors. So these need to be right out there and they need to be maintained for a very long time. Otherwise, you will never start from these grassroots ideas, which then grow and people take it over. At the end, in Europe, it's the same thing. You have people that do these things because they want to do them. And then 10 years later, everybody else is following. Uh, and of course, yeah, we see also that we have to accelerate this, but you have to start somewhere. And, and that is not different from Europe than in, in, in Africa, I think. So, and certainly when you do mechanization, that's one leap in your investment profile, which goes way up. Uh, so how do you do that? So that's that's about is also the stability that you need in terms of what, what are the goals that we want to reach. If you put them too high and then after a few years it fails, then what do you do? So that would be my, my additional input to that uh, question. Um, there was also the question of solutions for Africa in terms of electric uh, vehicles. So uh, maybe to state, so below 100 kilowatt is what is now possible in Europe. That you can say, okay, you have still have a huge cost for this machinery, but in certain use cases, this worked in niche applications or in, in, in barns with livestock, et cetera, cleaning, et cetera. Also, we, we use them a lot in robotization. 
would this work in Africa? Well, that's the whole point. Like, what is the robust, uh, robustness, for instance, of these systems? Will they be, for instance, if they would be very simple and they can be used for 20 years on end without having too much maintenance, uh, you can charge them yourself because you might have enough sun. May maybe there are solutions that could work. Uh, certainly also because in Africa, probably you don't need that high power. So you could even have hand tools that you could use uh, electrically steered, which put the price much, much more, much lower. Um, also in Africa, the you see more and more discussions on the production of e-fuels. Huh? A major issue there is, is water availability, because still you need a lot of water to make e-fuels, but still uh, the abundance of sun could uh, help in making something for these countries to, to have actually an, an own source of, of energy, which could be a replacement for diesel, so an e-fuel. Um, the question from Leone and and Emilio, please. Yeah. Um, just to add on that, I think this afternoon uh, I have a colleague from CNH who will be addressing some uh, some mechanization topics around uh, more uh, southern hemisphere um, uh, geography. So I will not go much into that. Although, start just to add on electrification. When you think about 100% electrification on a machine, yes, it's very expensive. Uh, we're still at the beginning of it. We don't have the volumes as private investors to uh, to have uh, the, the the let's say the um, the payback. Uh, this is an important topic: the payback as a private investor. Um, sorry, uh, but hybrid machines probably will come in the panorama without being 100%. Uh, 100% electric. So there will be a certainly a a, 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 a few step stones before uh, you can see, let's say, that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, machinery in a competitive way, uh, at least coming from Europe. Now that I would address also one point is that we're, um, let's say, building machines as leaders in the industry in Europe, in North America, and we are obligated to a number of regulations. Southern Europe, maybe not. So the question is, would we need to be to obey or or in fact, can we kind of come to a volume for profitability based on the technology that does not have to meet the same regulations? That is a key question. When we think about all the problem together, and I agree with the point. I mean, when I, I said 4.7 uh, tons of CO2 per person around the world, it's because of northern hemisphere mostly. Southern hemisphere is not the polluting, is not the CO two producers. That's for sure. So there, there is potentially a thought in terms of partnership to grow, but that needs, uh, let's say, the industry to come together, but a number of countries to come together also to commit, so that these private investors can do something about it. Today, it's only what we can do on top of the major markets in terms of volume, which are highly regulated. So this would be another way of looking at things, looking for thinking out of the box. Now, coming back to, if you don't mind, <coughs> sorry, coming back to, to the other questions, uh, the potential of solution downscaling or enhancing pr the, the production around what I, I just mentioned. Uh, well, exactly, we're a private investor. We need a payback on the first investments. Uh, but of course, the research should not s s uh, stop there. I am contacted regularly by Southern Africa or African companies asking us to downscale uh, just the way uh, Joseph uh, described in a way. Um, probably this is something that we need to do, but we already have invested so much on the market being alone. And CNH did take a lot of risk and are putting today two tractors on the market on methane investing in benjamin bringing this solution alone most of the time so this is a big investment we also need to find the return on investment before we go very much further and satisfy all the diversity that we have around the table here so this is also reality in which we are living uh, because you're very right to bring your reality, but I need to bring ours as well. And uh, that's, uh, it's all, as you know very well, on your side, it's a question of money at the, at the end of the day uh, also. And it, it's it's going to be a little bit that, that subject uh, as well from our side. But definitely, 
uh, downscaling. This is what we did, bringing down to the size of the farm I mentioned. But there's also the diversity of the manure or the source of methane, because pork, poultry, other kind of livestock are very much possible. We're focused today on dairy, but they should not be, should be larger than that. Uh, and uh, and enhance the productivity of the material, of course. It's a never-ending story. Today, we started at our upgrader with a capacity of 20, uh, 20 kilos per hour. Uh, today, we're at 50. We, we we're looking at far more uh, far more uh, capacity per hour in terms of process to improve the 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 payback or the uh, let's say the uh, for the farmer I mean I mean here um, and the and the investment uh, sorry well the payback for the investment of the farmer sure in terms of time scale um, sorry I'm maybe a bit long but I'm answering a few questions there the question around the time scale uh, the the purpose of bringing the biomethane subject today is that it's a solution which is on the shelf we're starting it's true in England. But it's on the shelf. That means by 2030, we should be equipping hundreds of farms and 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 other technologies. We're talking about 2035, 2040. There's no infrastructure and so on. Today, this is on the shelf. We have a tractor running. We can produce biomethane. Manure is already there. Uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would like to include the participants online. Um, there is one question, I believe it's addressed to Joseph. Um, he says, William, there, by your presentation, the Sub Saharan Africa has the lowest electrification slash renewable, renewable energy, it's still using manual methods of agriculture. And despite all efforts to improve the situation, it still remains stagnant. What is the problem? I believe if the problem is identified, it can be easily solved. Is it possible to change the approach used in addressing the problem in Sub-Saharan Africa? Over. The golden question. What is the problem of uptake of mechanization in Africa? Well, um, I think we have a problem of accessibility. Um, that smallholders, but this can also be groups, uh, small associations, don't have the, um, the access to farm power sources. This can be we can we can keep the the ox power there for the time being, but we might be able to leapfrog it. And here I want to have to appeal back to the industry that the machinery supply chains into the rural areas of Africa, not only the, to the capital, but the, the district capitals, where we, where we need outlets, we need um, farmers and farmer groups to understand what's there. And we need a new, a new um, breed of entrepreneurs who are um, hiring out farm power availability and um, tractors to, for cultivating and for seeding, planting, fertilizing. Um, and this is today not existing, but we are. This needs to put in place. And um, at the highest political level in Africa, the African Union Commission, together with FEU, have um, uh, developed this framework for sustainable mechanization in Africa and launched it four, five years ago already. And we are currently reviewing it and we are promoting it, at, because also at the political side, at the at the government, the side of the national governments, they are working on national strategies for sustainable mechanization. And again, the role of the private sector is um, inevitable for this. And um, another little appeal to the private sector, maybe the industry has gone too far, too fast, too big for the northern or the modern or the developed world. But the developing countries and sub-Saharan Africa, we still may need smaller equipment. Um, and here we can make the connection to battery-driven ideas. If we manage to get uh, solar power trans used for battery uh, loading, we could maybe have smaller tractors that are battery-driven and then the diesel problem would also be resolved here. So here is where the two streams come together, in my opinion. Thank you. 
I think Jordi wants to add something quickly, please. Yeah, very quickly. I think we have had a very interesting discussion. And you, just to add the context of Africa, because I, I consider myself still fresh from Africa. I think there are structural issues as well in, in Africa for the colleagues who are asking questions. So um, many regional and sub-regional blocks in Africa have come to realize that to increase productivity and efficiency in agriculture, they need mechanizations. That why, for example, in Southern part of Africa, they have approached you, Yosef, the sub-regional coordinator to develop the strategy for sustainable mechanization, for example. So the structural problem is there. We have to keep in mind that when we talk about Africa or sub-Saharan Africa for that matters, they are not uniform. They are diverse. There are countries in Africa who are advanced in agriculture. For example, South Africa, Rwanda is on, you know, on the way up. So we have to recognize these differences. Another element that are very common in Africa is land holdings. So land holdings in Africa and tenure security ownership is far complex than we imagine. So whatever technology that we want to transfer or we want to introduce to Africa, we'll have to recognize these differences, the context sensitive situation, technology that work for smaller, small holders, but also compatible to those who are working in the farm. 64% of the farmers in Africa are women. So we have to take all this into account. And then from the policy and you know, aspect, you know, Africa needs to do a lot to develop the policy that support mechanization and also you know, fuel efficiency, sustainability and whatnot. So Africa is there. You know, a lot of initiative that we have introduced through South-South Triangular Cooperation what TK is alluding now is also to strengthen the cooperation of North South, South South cooperation. You know, we have one you know office here that promote this. So a lot of learning has been transferred. For example, in terms of rice farming from Thailand, Vietnam, and China, in terms of mechanization of rice farming from China. So how do we actually educate and build awareness for the kinds of you know technology that you have invented here? Africa will need to know this now. We have to pilot it there to the context and situation. Thank you. Very last question because I don't want to leave anybody. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, I guess you will take the question during the lunch. So thank you so much. I mean, I'm always afraid that the most interesting interesting part that is the question and answer and discussion is always the shorter. You should change, you know. But now it's time to move to the closing remarks, and I would like to invite Jelte from Sima and Joseph from to provide them. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much uh, to have her, us here as an agricultural machinery industry. I think we're, we're facing global challenges that, uh, and to move away from fossil fuels where our technology developed on the shelf technology indeed as Gilles said for meaning not lay, lay, lying around on the shelf, but you can buy it now, uh, is, is to the advantage of us all globally. Because uh, burning fossil fuels for sure has an impact on agriculture, uh, an impact that could be negative and is negative already here and there globally. So working, working on high-end technologies in Europe, North America, elsewhere, by moving a, and moving away from fossil fuels is also to the advantage of African farmers at the end of the day, because um, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we're in the same boat. It's and, and, it's not or, or. I think that's very important to, to stress. Um, I'm uh, very much looking forward to continue this conversation, because I think it's an important conversation because we can have machinery, of course, um, in place, but no energy means the machine doesn't function. And this is a reality that is absolutely true everywhere, globally. So uh, the two things come together, and we would be very willing as an industry 
to keep uh, bringing our insights around energy and mechanization forward uh, within the FAO and its platforms, because um, it's a topic that um, is absolutely key for food security, for stability of uh, diet for everybody in the world. And we wish that everybody in the world. So that's what I would like to say as closing remarks. And of course, um, Josef uh, has been working extremely hard to pull all this off. So <laughs> I would um, ask for an extra round of applause for Josef for uh, doing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. You had and, and everybody, thank you, Sima, for being for coming in in a fairly substantial delegation. With you are all high level, I mean, managers, and you have a lot of things to do. We know that, so I, I want to thank you again for being here. Yes. Fortunately, it's only just lunch time soon, and um, I want to the little discussion between uh, Chike and Yelte just before about partnerships. We will continue on that discussion this afternoon about, uh, about partnering up between the private sector, specifically SEMA and FAO. So that's a very good, a very good news. But if I look at the three presentations and the discussion, um, <clears throat> I mean, SEMA is in the jungle of the, Afri of the European, uh, let's say, rules and regulations, and they are very complex. And there is a lot of emphasis on emission reduction and uh, methane reduction and uh, all this kind of the, the, all the goals that we have. Uh, the, in in Sub-Saharan Africa and in FAO, we have the sustainable development goals and the reducing poverty, reducing hunger is our 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 clear objectives. So I think we need in the end maybe we need a twin track approach where we look at specifically the African continent that needs a kind of concerted action, like maybe in the past, the Marshall Plan was for Europe. We need an, an, a similar plan to, to push mechanization in a sustainable way and uh, to give the private sector the, the, um, the space it needs, the, the rules and regulation it needs to prosper and to develop a supply chain and uh, and maybe FAO can do something in the capacity building and uh, promotion of higher services for access increasing accessibility of me mechanization and the private sector shouldn't forget that we also need small machinery not only the big ones um, specifically for the smaller uh, holdings in the African area um, but I want to also comment on 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 URD. each country in Africa is different and uh, there are very good examples and there are countries that are lacking a little bit behind. So it's not one block, it's um, 54 countries and uh, each of them has a has a different pace. And that one I should also not, should, we shouldn't forget. With this, I also want to thank Yelte for uh, who has helped and uh, we worked on this and we shouldn't forget that this was, this meeting is in the end of the day also a follow-up meeting to the global conference we had in September. Um, where we understood that we need the private sector for developing uh, and moving together, specifically to develop and accelerate mechanization in Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you to the online participants. Thank you to SEMA delegation, FAO colleagues. Thank you to everyone.